So it is time now, ladies and gents, for our final panel discussion of the day, our final panel discussion of the conference. And this is going to be discussing learning for a sustainable future and how the SDGs are shaping education. So please join me in welcoming our moderator for this panel, Dr. Asli Hussan, Director at Center for Teaching and Learning, Khalifa University. going to be quick, short, and sweet. <laughs> um, this last panel is actually, the topic is learning for a sustainable future, how the SDGs are shaping education. So um, I'm happy to be the moderator, and I would like to uh, basically introduce the topic. As you know, education is a catalyst for change and sustainable development. And we have panelists in this group that are coming from a variety of uh, different areas of education, and I'm happy to welcome them. I'd like to welcome uh, Yuka. She's a founder, CEO, and director of Kurio Japan and One Young World. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Iman. Uh, she's a program director and associate professor at uh, Birmingham University. I'd like to invite Dr. Filoni, CEO, FA Innovations from UK. And I would like to invite Dr. Mario, who's the Director of Research, Innovation, and Change Management. We're going to go ahead and um, introduce ourselves. All right, thank you, Ashley. Um, my name is Yuka Imanishi. I'm from Tokyo, Japan, and I'm very happy to be here with all these great panelists today on the stage. And uh, I'm the founder and CEO of the company called Curio Japan. And my company's mission is to globalize Japan. So my company provides training programs to um, corporations in Japan about diversity, about intercultural communication, and um, about um, globalization in general. And also, I'm a director at um, Global Platform for Young Leaders called One Young World. I don't know if you have heard of that platform, but um, in media, it's called Young Davos, because uh, we invite young leaders from all over the world, from 18 years old and 32 years old. And we have an annual summit in different countries and this year, we had a summit in Manchester, and more than 2,000 young leaders from uh, 200 countries and regions gathered. And the topic was all about SDGs. And my organization, One Young Girl Japan, provides um, SDGs-related programs to high school students. So um, I would like to discuss um, that program in this panel. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Iman Tibovi. Uh, I'm a program director at, of um, finance in uh, University of Birmingham. Uh, University of Birmingham is one of the top 100 universities in the world. Um, I work in the business school which is, uh, has a triple crown accreditation, AACSB, Equus, um, and the AMBA for the Association of MBA. So it has all three international accreditation that can possibly be granted to um, business school. So we rank among the top 1% business school in the world. Um, SDGs are at the heart of what we do at University of Birmingham as part of the strategy of the university in terms of teaching and research. Uh, so I'll be happy to tell you more about um, how we practice SDG at University of Birmingham today, um, and SDG in higher education in general. Thank you, Ayman. 
Uh, my name is Dr. Or Professor Floni Menon. Uh, what I do is basically very interesting because I'm in the field of uh, education, but corporate education. So all the football players, uh, they come to us for learning um, MBA or doctorate. So we are into many clubs, Chelsea Football Club, uh, Manchester United. So it's very invitation, by invitation only. Plus we create a specialized education for women over 50 uh, who have uh, left education for a long period of time and in the middle of the life's turmoil has forgotten somewhere their own individuality. So we try to create their individu individuality through sustainable education. And uh, apart from that, we run our education consultancy as well with FA Innovation UK. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Mario Chiasson. Uh, as uh, our colleagues has mentioned, I'm the Director of Research, Innovation and Change Management at a French public schools in New Brunswick, Canada. I'm also an associate professor at University of Moncton. Uh, so aligned with the theme of this, uh, of this uh, thematic, uh, our district have a special pro program which is called Intrapreneur, Centrapreneur en Francais, which is basically like, you know, integrating and interfusing the seven SDGs as part of this. So we're here to share our little bit stories about how this philosophy is anchored with our values as a district supported by research. Okay, thank you, thank you all. I'm gonna start asking uh, questions to our panelists. Well, I'll start with Yuka. Uh, the first question, how is the movement of SDGs changing the education for high schoolers? Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, my organization provides um, programs about SDGs to high school st students in Japan. And um, well, teaching about SDGs cannot be like lecture type, um, especially to high school students. They have to, there are no right answers for SDGs, but um, especially Japanese high school students are not used to studying or um, thinking about something that doesn't have right answers, correct answers. But uh, in terms of SDGs, we have to think of out of box. We have to have many different perspectives and approaches. So um, my organization's approach about SDGs education to high schoolers is not about lecture type, but we engage social entrepreneurs all over the world. And uh, we try to um, make them interact with each other and work on the same project together for uh, several months. And um, high school students are supposed to give presentations or like pitch to social entrepreneurs from all over the world and then they discuss what can be done together in the future. So through those interactions, high schoolers get the hands-on information, more like realistic approaches to uh, issues we have, issues we face in the world. So that's the approach. I mean, interaction with the actual um, social entrepreneurs um, is they um, is changing how they study about um, SDGs compared to the conventional studies in the classroom. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And now we'll move to higher education. Uh, Dr. Iman, as a professor and a professional in higher education, how do you see the role of higher education in developing professionals who will work towards a sustainable future? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I will go back to the basics, which is how did the United Nations, when they defined the SDG, how did they define education for SDG? Um, so education for uh, sustainable development, or um, uh, ESD, as it was defined by the UNESCO, uh, has a specific de definition, which is creating and incorporating subject relevant in the curriculum to deliver uh, sustainable, these sustainable goals. Um, so how do universities embrace that? So wha what is the role of higher education and all of that? Um, if I think attending all these sessions in the last uh, three days, and we are the last session <laughs> of these three days, I think there is a clear understanding that students are no longer uh, recipient of learners and ha they have to be participants in this learning process and if we think when we think about education at um, in higher education specifically students already achieved a certain level of maturity and they will go and face the world 
uh, and will have to deal with the legacy that we left them with, to be very frank, which is not necessarily they have a certain level of prosperity, but they also c have a very heavy legacy to deal with. So they need to go and solve problems uh, related to climate change, to sustainable business, to health, to poverty, which we teach them in business school, co corporate social responsibility. So in university, what we're doing is a big job, which is this is where you will graduate your next policy makers. This is where you graduate scientists, their physicians, architects who need to think about sustainable cities, sustainable environment. Um, so all of them are formed at the university level. They are pre prepared at other stages. Nowadays, in primary schools, I see a lot of primary schools say, my kids are in primary and they already know the SDGs. Um, and they are introduced to that in secondary, it's reinforced, but at the university, this is where you show you have to gain the final skills to become a problem solver uh, and part of the solution. You will graduate and be part of the solution. Um, so this is the where the um, role of higher education comes, uh, where you start need to start thinking at that higher level uh, to, to find solution. So university need to build that into the curriculum. Uh, one may think as a finance professor, how do I deliver sustainability or the SDG in the curriculum? When you think about finance, I know a lot of you, what springs to mind is greed. Um, because businesses eventually um, face a lot of dis disruption these days regarding uh, climate change because of climate change. Um, it has an economic impact on them. It has an impact on their stock price, for example. So we teach students how to make money by investing in stock, but we can also teach them how to do it ethically. We can teach them, for example, about scandals, uh, greenwashing. If, we, if I can name, for example, Volkswagen, they were caught in 2017 in a scandal of greenwashing, uh, selling vehicles, claiming that uh, uh, they are sustainable vehicles and clean vehicles where they d definitely cheated the devices that would capture the gas emission and they were simply vehicles with high gas emission. Um, and Volkswagen was caught with that cheating, for example. So it has reputational risk on the company. It has an impact on the stock prices, on the valuation of the company, and it's a legacy that the company will carry for many, many years. So in business, we teach them a lot about responsible business because beyond making money, you have to think about the environment and the legacy you live. You have to think about equal wages, which are part of the uh, better wages and less poverty, which are part of the SDG. So it has to be a holistic approach where students, when they study finance, at the end of the day, we need to ingrain the value of ethics in them. And if you think about SDG, it's all about ethics, acting ethically. If we summarize and the role of education, whether it's high education or other level of education, if you think about the 17 SDG, 16 of them can be achieved through the SDG number four, which is education. If we do a good job in education, teaching students more than technical skills, solving problems, knowing theories, they will be able to think critically and think ethically and find solution and create wealth, which are also part of the SDGs, uh, create wealth while preserving the environment and working on sustainable, sustainable businesses at the end of the day. So all the SDGs can be achieved if we do a good job in SDG number four, which is quality education. Thank you, Dr. Iman. Now we're gonna move on to um, career changers and Dr. Floney is gonna share uh, her answer to this question. How can we achieve SDGs through lifelong learning? Thank you, Dr. Rasli. So this is a very interesting question because we all are living in a different world and we are going to evolve in a completely different world. We are going to evolve in four different worlds, the green, blue, yellow, and red. I'm really not sure how many of you have heard about these four new world of education. Now, uh, Harvard and PwC has intensely researched on this four world, where the blue world is going to be very much corporate, and the yellow world is going to be entrepreneurship, and the green world is going to be sustainable, and the red world is all about innovation. Now the question is, the world is going very exponential, and our education system is very linear. Where is the gap? There's a huge gap between the exponential world where we are, and the linear world what in the education system. 
So basically, lifelong learning is an aspect that can actually become the building block of actually bridging this gap. But the question is also, we are creating a solution and then also creating a problem for the solution. So when I mean a problem for the solution, um, this was from Birmingham University uh, in London. I was trying to create um, assessment module. And when I was creating an assessment module, I integrated the lifelong learning system. Usually what professors say, is, uh, they always say that, whatever I have taught you, that's what I want to see in the assignment. Now what my approach was, I want you to integrate what you have learned as a part of lifelong learning and integrate that into your assignments. Come with your own critical models. Don't repeat the models that you're constantly learning because by doing that, we are creating more followers rather than trendsetters. But this was rejected. The proposal was completely rejected and they had a standard layout everyone had to do. So although we are trying to say that we want lifelong learning to be integrated, we want to be in the exponential world, somehow we are ourselves creating a stumbling block for achieving our sustainable development goal number four. And um, that's something that I, would, I wanted to say, Dr. Rasli, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Now, Dr. Mario, we're gonna go to the community. What type of system transformation is needed to amplify the SDGs? Yeah, thank SDGs. you. There, the, my dear colleagues there have mentioned a lot, so I'll, keep, I'll be brief, but a quick summary there is, it was very powerful for my colleagues. So the sense of community, uh, of course, like you know, we're, a very, we're living in a period that is very turbulent in many ways, geopolitics, ethics, and et cetera, et cetera. So we need to have uh, some kind of a different mindset and different structure and different culture to say what is learning as part of the learning journey of a citizen. So the role of the schools, as we all know, right, so we want to make sure that we want to create or produce and develop a citizen can contribute to the innovative society. And every day, the school system is to develop a student who wants to be innovative and be part, part of a better world tomorrow. Uh, so foundly, that's probably like you know, the, the foundation of what is a school as part of the community. So that being said, we can't be alone. So the school system cannot be alone. So we need to create establish a uh, uh, partnership with our community members. So in a non-sense, if community members is providing a, a resource to be part of the learning and the teaching and the leading journey of our future as leaders to make a better world, we need to create now a dynamic collaborative culture. And this dynamic collaborative culture within the communities, right, is basically having a different mindset that the community is our school. And our school is the innovative learning center to respond to the regional solution that needed by the community. So to prepare our future students, we need to provide authentic learning journeys that's gonna respond to the local, to, uh, the local economy, but also develop the real skills that our future citizen needs to be. So we need to come up with, create a context where that our community is agile in as much organic, and I, we heard the word organic in our previous, and it's exactly the case. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So we took you through a journey, uh, starting from Japan to UAE, then to UK, and then to Canada, and actually really globally. Uh, now we're gonna go back to uh, another series of questions. And then we'll have time for you to ask us questions. Um, uh, you ca I'm coming back to you. Um, what is needed to further accelerate the SDGs education, especially among high schoolers? Thank you. Um, I want to focus on the high schoolers because that's what I do. I teach high school students in Japan. And uh, as I said, um, making them interact with um, people who are actively um, trying to do something to make a difference in the world, like social entrepreneurs, that's one thing, that's what I have been doing, and uh, that's working. It's a great opportunity for PBL, project-based learning, to solve social issues. You need a lot of knowledge about different things. It involves like history, math, or society, so it's a great opportunity for them to learn about um, so many different things through working uh, with entre social entrepreneurs. And also, um, there are so many um, high schoolers in Japan who are trying to make a difference in the world, but because they're all still teenagers, they don't have a lot of opportunities to shine 
they don't have a platform to, to present their ideas to the world. So um, I wanted to give them an opportunity to pitch their ideas to the world. So that's why uh, my organization started this initiative called Student Pitch. And uh, we invite um, all teenagers under 18 um, to apply to be on the stage in Tokyo, which will be uh, broadcasted onli online live. And we did the first student pitch this summer and about 50 applicants from all over Japan and uh, 10 of them were selected to do the pitch um, on stage. But their ideas are amazing. And uh, once they were selected, uh, we assigned some social entrepreneurs as mentors to accelerate their programs and, in and the initiatives. And in the, in the short few months, their ideas and their, their activities were so um, refined and sophisticated and they, they had the motivation, they had the encouragement. So they were just amazing. And uh, I want to keep um, providing those opportunities for high schoolers so that they can, they can show their abilities to the world and they, they can feel that they can make a difference in the world at the young age. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much, that's so interesting. Uh, Dr. Iman, uh, what do you believe is the best process to implement uh, of the 2030 SDG agenda into the curriculum through education, teaching, and learning? Uh, thank you, Asli, for your question. Um, actually, I will take a step back uh, just to explain that the SDG were developed in 2015 uh, with a target to try to achieve them in 2030. So the goal in terms of education is for all learning by 2030 to be fully aware of the SDG uh, across the globe and across all levels of education. Um, when I think about where we stand in terms of implementation of SDG in the curriculum, there are universities that are really made a lot of progress uh, in this matter, incorporating this into the curriculum, creating programs, etc. And there are other universities uh, and schools that the co where the conversation did not even start. Uh, there's no conversation around SDGs in the curriculum whatsoever. Um, so there's a big gap around the world uh, among all those countries, well, over 160 countries that signed um, the uh, Paris Agreement, where they stand in terms of incorporating the SDG into their cur uh, curriculum. Um, so what's the best way to proceed with this? Because of how much disparity there has been, uh, in this matter, and because a lot of countries also fell behind because of the COVID-19, uh, not everybody is set for success in achieving the SDG by 2030. Um, so for, for this reason, I think the best way to start is to start with national policies. If there are na no national policies to ensure that all um, institutions start a conversation and start working on incorporating SDG, maybe the progress will be very, very slow. If it's the left at the discretion of uh, academic institutions who have their own constraints and other goals maybe the conversation will be or the progress will be extremely slow um, in many parts of the world. So I think the conversation or the it should start with the policy and with that universities should have their own strategies uh, on how to implement that into the curriculum. Uh, so once the universities start implementing their own strategy it has to be channeled through schools, uh, through departments, and then to uh, specific courses. Um, so if we think about how we implemented it in University of Birmingham. University of Birmingham uh, has an office for sustainability. So they have officer and an entire department dedicated to sustainability. Um, as a university, we, have our, we, we are accountable for sustainability as well, and I leave that uh, conversation to the end, but we started by looking by creating first new programs around sustainability across all schools, whether it's engineering or health uh, or science or business. Then we looked into specific program that are existing. So we created new program that have a component of sustainability. Then we looked at um, existing program, what can we change about them and how we can incorporate sustainability into the program. So if I think about business, for example, we created 
uh, a module, a class called Accounting for um, Gas Emission or Climate. Uh, so we created a new uh, module because we can clearly see that businesses do not, there's a lot of talk uh, among businesses about how to incorporate sustainability within their business, but no clear action. They really don't know where to start with that. So we created an accounting class around that. And then we um, thought through our modules, our classes, where can we incorporate sustainability? Many of us are already doing uh, uh, things within the curriculum in management, in business, uh, around sustainability, but we don't necessarily identify them to the SDG. Um, so we start identifying what are we already doing? We are already think doing things that we don't necessarily name as SDG. So now we start recognizing that. Let's say in my classes, I teach ethics and finance. And in ethics and finance, I teach corporate governance which is how you organize your board and uh, of directors and governance within the company. Within that, I teach them about gender equality. That's SDG number five. So I used to teach it without realizing that I'm tackling an SDG, but then it comes the realization that you're already doing it. So um, we modified learning outcomes, uh, existing learning outcomes to incorporate more SDGs. Um, you, we also channeled it to students. Students are the power force in, in any university, in any institution. So we channeled that through um, student association. And students are also, um, so there is an association in the UK, which is the Association of Student for Sustainab Sustainability, it's called SOS UK. Um, so uh, students are also a force behind this change because also they, their feedback leads us to think what can we do better in terms of our uh, curriculum to tackle sustainability issues. Um, we report in at the end of each teaching uh, cycle, what did we do to tackle some of the uh, sustainability issue and we do, what do we do, plan on doing for uh, during the next offering. So these are different mechanisms that can help frame how we incorporate uh, sustainability goals within the curriculum. Uh, um, universities also have to be accountable for sustainability, so they have to demonstrate that they walk the talk. So we don't just put a framework for students to work with and to teach uh, in our programs, but the university also makes itself accountable. Um, so we have goals of net zero gas emission by 2040, uh, we have goals of building uh, sustainable campuses. So uh, we build the campus in Dubai, actually, uh, which is the campus where I work here in Dubai. Uh, University of Birmingham is based in the UK, but it went global, and we have now a campus in Dubai, and the campus is built around uh, s sustainability. Um, so there are lots of things that can, that can work for us in the curriculum. When we think just a simple example, SDG number three, which is about health and well-being, it can easily be incorporated in any sports management program, uh, psychology programs, um, all sorts of, uh, all kind of healthcare medicine type of uh, studies. So there are lots of SDG that can easily be implemented here, and that's the process universities and higher education institutions need to ingrain uh, among the, the in the curriculum and among the students. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ima. Now we're going to move to Dr. Floni. Can you tell us why is AI, integrated learning, vital in the race of, uh, to meet the SDGs? Thank you. That's a very thought through question, Asli, Dr. Asli. So um, basically, we all keep talking about artificial intelligence, you know, uh, technology. The question is, what are we go doing about it? Nobody is doing anything about it, although maybe even if we want to do something about it, there's corporate governance that has certain rules and regulations that nobody is able to climb the ladder through. Now, I'll give you some example. As professors, we have so many modules to take in a certain period of uh, time, and we are thrown with 20, 25 students in each class. Now, each uh, semester has about two uh, exams. And every time they give us these assessments, they want us to mark within two weeks. Now, we have to be conscious that it's not just one set of students or not one module. We are teaching five modules at the same time. What happens at the end of the day? We are human beings. Psychologically, can any one of you here tell me that you'll be perfect to mark everyone with 100% you know, concentration and 100% without being biased? I'm sure 90% of you are going to say, 
No, that's the reality. Even if you said yes, I won't believe it. Okay, so integrating artificial intelligence would actually make sure, as a software example is grade score, it can reduce our marking uh, time by 70 percentage. Because what it does it, it extracts all the important weakness, strength of a particular candidate, and it will ensure that it gives us a nutshell. And then it becomes very easy for us professors to just write the most important aspect and sign off. Likewise, think mass, maths. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, gone through this think maths. Now, thinkster maths, what it does is, everybody has a way of reasoning and coming with, an, uh, with a way of solving a problem. The artificial intelligence actually tries to understand what is your logical system and then tries to make you understand and do solve the problem based on your understanding. Because my understanding and perspective of solving a problem would be exactly different from yours. So how does, how, why don't we integrate all this system? How many of us know? And especially the pandemic, when the pandemic arrived in 2020, we were able to see how we have not or underused artificial intelligence. 70% of the professors lost their job because either they were very traditional or they didn't believe in artificial intelligence. Now the problem is not believing in artificial intelligence was not their problem. It was the problem of the corporate governance because there was no awareness and there was no initiation of upskilling each one of these people to understand. So people, either they become a uh, digital primitive or they actually adopt to this and move on. So with my first question and the second question, in a nutshell, I would just like to say that using artificial intelligence, we are preparing ourselves for a very much sustainable future. Eliminating it and by thinking that it's going to be a problem for us and we are going to, uh, the, the artificial intelligence is taking our job, that's completely a wrong way of thinking because they are here to help us and we have higher things to do. And that's why both lifelong learning and integrating artificial intelligence is one of the best way to achieve our sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, now, Dr. Mario, we consider ourselves that we are in a period called Industry 4.0. Is the current system leadership well equipped to nurture such a system transformation? Yes, it's well equipped. There's one of the five elements that we need to address. Uh, so we're, uh, my colleague was just mentioned about there's a gap between the formal education system 020 versus the, innovate, the challenge of innovative societies. And the innovative societies are evolving so much rapidly than the current education, formal education. So that's becoming, we you know, the tension between our realities. And that could be explained in five elements. The first element is the evolution of ICT, we were just like talking about. The second one there is the evolution of autonomy, uh, the, uh, not autonomy, but uh, automation. The third one is the evolution of economy, which is like one of the three pillars. There is entrepreneurial mindset as part of their learning culture, but also we've got arts and we also have physics. The fourth element is the evolution of environments. And this environment could be local, but could well be physical, can be also virtual, and can also be hybrid. And the fifth one, in, for our understanding, is the most important one, is the evolution of leadership. So at every evolution of the industry, we had an evolution of leadership. And we do believe that actually, we're living in a period of leadership 2.0. Uh, so education from a leadership mindset is at 2.0, and the industry is 4.0. That's one of the explanations. So we need to figure out, you know, what is the role of a leader in the industry 4.0, and what is the role of a leader in the education 2.0, so we can understand that. And what we're realizing is that industry 2.0 is directive leadership. Industry 4.0 is connection leadership. And the more you're connected to the local, to the international, you totally redefine and redesign the role of the student, the teacher, and the principal. So in a dynamic pedagogy, the student creates, the student validates, and the student reflects. The teacher guides, the teacher assists the learning and coordinate the pedagogy. And the school principal is actually managing this new dynamic collaborative culture at the school by mobilizing community members to respond to the skills needed, but at the same time, personalize the teaching while that the teachers can personalize the learning. So I'll give you an example. So the teacher's role to create 
context, with a mission, with expectation. So it starts with expectation. What's the learning outcome and what's the local and global competencies that the student will be developed part of the learning journey? So what's the mission and what's the context? So the context needs to be responding to the local need so they can make a better world. So an example that we have a school that have issues with vaporing, like, you know, this, how can we solve that from programming that it can be do some prevention and how we can have program that can do intervention while we can educate our students, educating our parents, education also our community. Thank you very much. Now we do have five minutes to take your questions. for us I think everyone is tired as yeah. I said <laughs> and it's the last everyone wants yes. to just run home <laughs> including us maybe <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you so much for your time thank you Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep our applause going, please, for our final panel discussion of the day and of the conference. Thank you so much, panelists. That was excellent.